Good afternoon to all the dignitaries and delegates present with us on this informative academic forum. We are honored to have you all with us. Let us begin this valedictory session. I invite Dr. Sushil K. Matthews, sorry, Dr. Sushil Mary Matthews, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, PSGR Krishnamal College for Women for welcoming the gathering. Thank you, Sondarya. Good afternoon, everyone. The International Seminar on Recent Trends in Children's Literature, hosted by our department, has today proved to be a platform to enhance the development of language and thinking skills that provide the foundation for learning. Literature has always helped to unravel the complexity and cognitive capabilities of children and young adults. And this seminar has been an assemblage of scholars from far and near to engage in this noble venture. Hence, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome the luminaries and the participants for this valedictory session. It is with great joy that I welcome Professor Kimberly Reynolds, School of English Literature, Language and Linguistics, Newcastle University, UK. She has received many accolades. In 2013, she was honored with the International Brothers Grimm Award for her research contributions to children's literature. She was the first director of the National Center for Research in Children's Literature and was involved in founding UK's Children's Laureate, the National Center for Children's Books. She was also the president and honorary fellow of International Research Society of ARC Center of Excellence for the History of Emotions at the University of Western Australia. Between 2016 and 21, she was the senior editor of International Research in Children's Literature and is on the scientific board of the Center for Research on Children's and Young Adult Literature, University of Rockland. She has authored three books, inclusive of an anthology. It is with great pride that I welcome this intellectual genius amidst us. I also extend a warm welcome to Dr. Chitra, faculty and head postgraduate De Department of English, Yonfula Centenary College, Royal University of Bhutan, Dr. Anto Thomas, Associate Professor and Head Research Center, uh, St. Thomas College, Rishu, our secretary, principal, all our deans, the resource persons who chat the technical sessions, faculty of both aided and self-financing departments of English of our college, the participants, scholars, and students. Once again, a hearty welcome to each one of you for yet another enlightening session. Thank you. It's over to you, Dr. Reynolds. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so pleased to be here. I know you've had a very full day already. It's an impressive program that you've been attending, but I'm glad that you've made time to join us for this valedictory session. And I just need to thank my friend and colleague, Anto Thomas, for making the introduction and to Dr. Mathanji for the invitation to speak with you this afternoon. And thank you to the college for hosting us. It's very, <laughs> It makes me very pleased to see so many people wanting to study and think seriously about children's literature, both in its local and its international context. Now, I'm a fear, I, I fear that my knowledge of publishing in India is very limited and also out of date. So this is going to be a very Western centric talk but I hope that there will be enough similarity in our globalized world for some of what I say to be relevant. I have recently heard some papers about contemporary young adult fiction in India, and it seemed to me that we are very much on the same wavelength in many ways. But we're going to go back in time with my talk, back to um, the 20th century. I'm about to share my screen and I will begin the talk properly. Okay, here we go. Should be sharing. 
yeah, for some reason it's deciding to start at the bottom. Here we go. There we go. Okay, so you can see my talk. I've, I've it's really going to cover everything from the 1960s to the 1980s, but primarily looking at the 1960s and 70s. Is it possible to write a sexual piece for children that is so objective and compassionate that the turn on is lost in deeper emotion in the reader? If it is pornographic, would it be harmful to young readers? These questions were put to Nancy Chambers, who you see here, by the British children's writer, Robert Westall, also shown. He was writing in 1978, and at the time, Chambers, who was a former children's book editor, was then the founder and editor of the journal Signal, Approaches to Children's Literature. And that was um, a journal that she and her husband had set up to fill a gap in the intellectual knowledge about children's literature in Britain. The questions that Westall puts to her are part of an exchange about an article for Signal. Previously, Westall had not thought it appropriate to talk about sex in his novels, but from this point, he began to explore how it might be done. Today, when YA novels cover a great variety of sexualities, sexual behaviors, and scenarios, the kinds of anxieties and aims Westall and his contemporaries had around sex and YA literature may seem exaggerated and even parochial. In fact, those early attempts to talk about sex tell us quite a lot about where we are today and why certain aspects of sexuality are now particularly problematic. In Abstinence Cinema, Casey Ryan Kelly identifies attitudes to virginity as indicators of ideological struggles active in society at any given time. His interest is in what can be learned from how American popular films present virginity, but why a fiction, which is addressed to an age for which loss of virginity is particularly relevant, is even more sensitive to ideological forces focusing on this area. Kelly's study offers ways of understanding when and how YA fiction began to engage with sex. The years between 1975 and 95 saw explicit sexual content, usually centering on first love and loss of virginity, entering the developing YA literary scene. As Kelly suggests, this was not a straightforward indicator of changing attitudes to sexual morality for, as we will see, the books kept a weather eye on conservative forces even as those forces seemed to be in retreat. The history of YA fiction and sex dramatizes ideological struggles around patriarchal conservatism with its emphasis on family values and authority and sexual liberation, which was then associated particularly with feminism and equal rights. Both the original ideologies and the strategies for managing them have proved difficult to dislodge, so turning the clock back to the conditions under which YA fiction began to talk about sex has resonance for that conversation today. And I think it's um, pertinent to this discussion to know that it was in 1973 that the very famous um, Roe v. Wade debate in the US Supreme Court, which enabled um, abortion for women uh, on demand, uh, was passed and of course that is now being contested very um, hotly in the US Supreme Court again. Okay, how you understand sexual attitudes depends on context. Foucault begins his history of sexuality with precisely this point. What is accepted and unproblematic in one place and time may be pathologized and demonized in another or vice versa. When we look at texts and images from the past, we can't avoid bringing our current understandings, attitudes, and concerns into play. But that inevitable presentism needs to take account of how innovations registered at the time and what they signified for young readers, children's authors, and the children's publishing world. The last century saw two notable efforts to introduce sexual content into YA fiction. The first, I can deal with very quickly, but if you're interested in it, um, I discuss it in detail in my book, 
left out. And there's also a very large section on early uh, attempts to include sex in the anthology that I edited with two colleagues called Reading and Rebellion. Its significance for us is that its underpinning ideas were revived in the 1970s. So in this early attempt, um, we, what we see is that um, writers and illustrators were drawing on the psychological theories of Sigmund Freud, Wilhelm Reich, and William Drain, James. And this very small group of liberal thinkers identified sexual repression as a significant cause of personal and social illness. They regarded war in general and the rise of fascism specifically as products of sexual repression. In an attempt to break the cycle of repression and conflict, not least as manifested in two world wars, they set out to change attitudes to sex, including in the rising generation. Now at that time, the principal tool for reaching out to the young was print. A few progressive educators and creators of books for children and adolescents produced information books, leaflets, articles, and a handful of novels that encouraged open discussion and new ways of thinking about sex. An editorial in the Young Socialist magazine explained why they did this. Sex subjects, it says, for growing people need to be handled carefully and delicately, but they need to be handled. Until such matters are dealt with openly in sympathetic and intelligent fashion, we may expect nothing but unhappiness to come as a result for years after. Prudery and calculated ignorance are responsible for a thousand evils in our land. Now, this first attempt to talk about sex failed, but the arrival of youth culture in the 1950s ushered in moral panics about the condition of youth in Britain and America, creating a conservative backlash focused on promis promiscuity and a perceived lack of respect for authority. And that's what nipped it in the bud. This was also the cultural climate, that conservative cultural climate in which children's literature became an established and successful branch of the publishing business, meaning publishers were acutely sensitive to the opinions of their principal purchasers, parents, teachers, and librarians. In both the US and the UK, the children's book industry subscribed to an unwritten rule that there would be no sex in children's books. This included the growing number of titles addressed specifically to teenagers. It took YA writers and publishers more than a decade to challenge that view. With the advantage of hindsight and through the filter of 21st century sensitivities, some of these pioneering texts may seem crude and possibly manipulative. These are the texts that I'm going to be talking about today. They privilege white, heterosexual, and male experience. Um, and females are very much invisible when it, you know, it comes to pleasure. In context, however, it seems clear that writers and editors were working out how to include sexual content of any kind in ways that would ring true to and be helpful to their readers without alienating the children's literature establishment. Before looking at how they did this, it's worth considering the effects of excluding sex from YA fiction. What were the consequences of that decision not to talk about sex? And also the cultural milieu in which children's literature makers were then situated. So more about context. When it comes to teenage sex, I regard myself as lucky. For my three older sisters, sex was an ever-present minefield with serious consequences. <clears throat> nice girls, as they were called, didn't do it, or at least so their parents and teachers wanted to think. And if you did and became pregnant, there were serious consequences, starting with the end of education. By the time I was 15, however, Birth control without parental consent was freely available and abortion was legal in nearby New York State. That was because of um, they were building up to the Roe v. Wade decision that I told you about. Three years later, William H. Masters and Virginia E. Johnson's influential study, Human Sexual Response, was a set text in many high schools and universities. Now, the important thing about Masters and Johnson for our purposes was, was its insistence that sex was not the preserve of adults, but a healthy, natural activity that promoted pleasure and intimacy, including in the young. So my generation of adolescents benefited from new attitudes to sex, but there was still no YA fiction that talked about sex. 
This literary silence was at odds with the increased access to information, contraceptive services, and the belief in young people's right to be sexually active promoted in popular media, the arts, women's groups, and best-selling books such as The Joy of Sex. Organizations such as Planned Parenthood, the Family Planning Association, and Brook Advisory Centers advertised their services in cinemas and magazines and sent materials to schools. There was then no shortage of practical, biological, and even erotic information. But when it came to the emotional and social dimensions of becoming responsibly sexually active, there was a notable lack of resources, not least in YA fiction. It wasn't just writers and publishers who were reticent. The 1970 report of the Commission on Obscenity and Pornography in the US found that most adults were unwilling or unable to talk about sex with the young. Sanctions it reported still inhibit the open discussion of sex, particularly in the relationships between young people and their parents, as well as between young people and other adults. The report also noted that many adults lacked reliable information about sex themselves, and that had been a long-standing problem. Many adults were really quite ignorant about sex and were not very successful at it. So most young people had no adult advice or guidance about managing sexual relationships, and indeed, for the most part, they felt the need to be secretive when it came to sex. This was especially true for girls, since what came to be called the nice girl construct continued to hold that girls should be chaste, gentle, gracious, ingenuous, good, clean, kind, virtuous, non-controversial, and above suspicion and reproach. Significantly for this discussion, chaste is first and foremost. Books that might encourage sexual activity then were not for nice girls. Arguably, the absence of novels featuring sexual relationships specifically for an audience of adolescents was more important than the lack of adult advice. This was understood by children's literature professionals. For instance, in her 1969 summary of the relationship between the library and the young adult, the US librarian Margaret Edwards made the case for good quality YA fiction. The best novels on the subject she maintained go beyond the facts to the emotional implications of love and offer a richer, more subtle message about sex for the adolescent than other likely sources. Unfortunately, researchers and policymakers did not consult those who observed young people's readings and, and needs, reading needs and behaviors at first hand. In the UK and US, those who were investigating young adults' sexual behavior and sources of information paid no attention to fiction and were evidently unaware of its potential to help develop such qualities as insight, empathy, and responsibility in relation to sex. Thus, while the Commission on Obscenity and Pornography did note that a quarter of boys and a third of girls used books as a major source of information about sex, there's no mention of what the books were or what kind of material they contained. Similarly, similarly, a 1963 British survey prompted by concerns about rising promiscuity in the young and designed to, quote, obtain facts about the sexual attitudes and behaviors of young people aged 15 to 19, looked at a variety of ways that young people learned about sex and contraception, but discounted books. The lead researcher, Michael Schofield, explained this was because quote, the many thousands of books published on this subject for adolescents, end quote, were read after there was some initial knowledge of contraception, if they were read at all. What these many thousands of books were is a mystery. And since the survey contained no questions about them, it's impossible to know whether or not they existed, let alone if they were read. I couldn't locate any that were specifically for young people. The lack of attention to and provision of novels and stories with realistic, reliable, and holistic sexual content is important. As Foucault points out, understanding of sex is an iterative process. While we're born into social ways of thinking about sex, these are not inevitable. Fiction provides a space where alternative iterations of how we understand ourselves in relation to sex and sexuality can be explored vicariously. Subsequently, this understanding of fiction in relation to sex, sexuality, sexualities, and the young has been studied. 
For instance, the Canadian educationalist Jen Gil Gilbert points to the importance of narratives of sexual development that can help young people inquire what she calls an interpretative practice that might help make sense of the upheavals of development and the tumultuousness of relationships. For Gilbert, as for others, reading about characters' experiences, desires, and feelings can expand thinking about what is normal, helping them to look differently at what they are told it is, at what they are told is and is not acceptable for young people to know. Thinking again of virginity as an indicator of ideological struggle, YA fiction has the potential to encourage change by examining exaggerated emphasis on virginity, virginity by powerful institutions, including families and religious organizations. It can also encourage readers to question the perception that its loss the loss of virginity marks an irreversible threshold to maturity. And I think that's something that books are beginning to explore now, the significance of that loss of virginity. In parts of Europe, YA fiction that promoted positive, guilt-free and responsible attitude to sex as part of youth culture was available um, before 1975. This was particularly true in the Netherlands, France, Germany and Sweden. The Dutch scholar Agnes Anderweg, for instance, shows that between 1945 and 1980, novels were a potent way of connecting people and providing a platform for ideas. Anderweg maps how during these years, literature helped shape Dutch attitudes to sex, making it one of the most sexually liberal countries in the Western world. Unsurprisingly, some of the first YA fiction to display an open and respectful attitude to sexual activity in young people appeared in the Netherlands. Meanwhile, in the absence of similar fiction, young people in the US and UK found whatever they could to help them prepare to become sexually active. Based on my own experience and information volunteered by three colleagues my age, some published recollections, a survey conducted by an American teacher visiting England in 1976, and a study by a British librarian, I've created a snapshot of the kind of material that dealt openly with sex that young adults appropriated from adult shelves in the absence of a literature of their own. Now, this is far from a scientific sample, of course. For a start, my colleagues and I were all white, heterosexual, and as far as I know, cisgender girls growing up in reading households, though the fact that two were raised in working class homes, one was from a military family based in Kenya, and I come from a middle class home in New England, gives some diversity of background and experience. So here, what were we reading? This is the uh, results of that snapshot. Girl one recalls that she and her best friend read Rosalind Erskine's 1962 novel, The Passion Flower Hotel, about girls in a boarding school losing their virginity. We hid it and read it secretly at night, she told me. It was fun and quite saucy. When much younger, we read the dirty bits in the Song of Solomon, a novel called Angelique with a busty heroine, and snatched passages in my parents' books, especially Harold Robbins's The Carpet Baggers and Peyton Place, which was also on TV. Girl two remembered that at her English boarding school, the girls passed around Angelique again, the original bodice ripper forever Amber, and books by Harold Robbins. She particularly remembered Stiletto. Girls one and three, both from working class homes, also read the magazine Jackie, which was published between 1964 and 93. Now Jackie styled itself as your top pop and romance paper. Romance here meant that it dealt with relationships between boys and girls and included a problems page which touched on issues such as how to know when the time was right to have sex. And that magazine and several others that followed it um, raised a lot of concern in adults and were even debated in Parliament. Growing up in the USA, I read many of the same books. We didn't have magazines like Jackie, though. Um, and as you may have noticed, most of the novels listed have had been around for years. Look, we've got 57, 56, 64, 61. The characters were not our age, mostly not even from our century, and their relationships were fairly torrid. They featured beautiful women whose looks gained them handsome lovers, often in high places, but rarely happiness or security. Their lives had little useful to say about unconfident teenagers with awkward bodies and the sexual thrills they experienced, 
were not typical of most Tyro lovemaking. None of us was aware of the skinhead books of Richard Allen. That was the pen name of somebody called James Moffat, which began to appear in 1971. Although the blog Nostalgia Central claims that for any kid attending a British comprehensive school between 1971 and 1977, Richard Allen's skinhead books were required reading. A 1976 investigation of books and the teenage reader in England reported that within five years, the first skinhead book had sold 250,000 copies, even though the books were not available in libraries or most mainstream bookstores. The researcher found them in a pornography shop. The report describes the series as truly appalling. The books alternate between aggro and sex. The report's author was particularly disgusted by a gang rake rape in which the girl victim finds herself enjoying the experience and the glorification of racist violence. The British librarian Margaret Marshall's 1975 study of libraries and literature for teenagers supports all of these findings, reporting that girls enjoyed romance, historical fiction, and more lurid sex no novels, while the boys um, like books about skinheads and gangs for the uninhibited sex, sexual deviation, physical violence, antisocial attitudes, motorbikes and cars. But boys explained that they really liked them because they were exciting and real. So all that violence, all that uninhibited sex, all that, they, that was their model of what was real. Now, as I said, their ideas of real are, are, are worth noting because they not only involve violence, but the use of both male and female characters of the opposite sex for personal gratification and exploitation. Also popular and a bit more lighthearted were the sexual farces featuring and purportedly by Timothy Lee, actually another pen name, Confessions of a Window Cleaner, uh, Confessions of a Driving Instructor, Confessions from a Holiday Camp, and so on, whose various jobs give him endless opportunities for erotic adventure. And as you might gather from the cover, these, these were made into um, films as well. None of the books in this sample is mentioned in any children's literature guide or companion, but young people relied on this kind of material because there was no YA fiction offering more balanced accounts of relationships between people like them. Since there was clearly a teenage market for books with some sexual content, children wanted to be reading these things. They wanted to read about sex. There had to be powerful reasons why children's publishers were slow to fill this gap, even when in many forums, attitudes to sexual activity in young people had relaxed considerably. A key factor was that those responsible for setting book buying budgets were divided about the benefits of being more open about sex with young people. With teenage pregnancy rates increasing, battles raged over whether sex education should be provided in schools and whether teenagers should have access to contraceptive advice. In Britain, the Department of Health and Social Care supported a range of sex education programs, but most favored a mechanistic biological approach that ignored such things as emotions, desires, and relationships. The idea of presenting teenage sex as natural and pleasurable was particularly contested. They didn't want to encourage activity. The arguments reached fever pitch in 1971 around growing up a set sex education film for schools, which you can now find in this um, DVD compilation. Created by the biologist, Dr. Martin Cole at his Institute for Sex Education and Research in Birmingham, it was grounded in the Masters and Johnson's philosophy that sex is a natural, pleasurable and healthy activity, including for young people. Like the writers earlier in the century, Cole claimed he wanted the film to reduce shame and anxiety about sex and bring home to the audience that sex is not just about sperms and smegna or the plumbing of the penis, but is also about erotic feelings. The result was the most explicit sex education film ever made, including now. Reviewing the film, the Times Educational Supplement described the con contentious parts of the film. These, it said, were the close-ups of genitals in various stages of development and arousal and the scenes which show sexual reproduction and masturb masturbation. An adolescent boy, naked except for a vest, is filmed lying on a bed. As he clearly fondles himself, the commentary gives an explicit description of what he's doing. 
masturbation, states the narrator, is important to development and provide, may provide a natural and healthy sexual outlet for adolescent boys for several years. The female scene is very similar, except that she is completely naked and lies on her side. The commentary also adds, as in a boy, masturbation in the girl is quite normal and also plays an important part in her development too. Sexual intercourse in the film is illustrated by a side view of a naked couple lying full length on a bare set. Emotion is slightly suggested by the slow, rather ritualistic body movements. Although, although very much of its time in terms of youth and popular culture, and it, I have to say it brought back a lot of memories of um, attitudes to me when I was watching it. Growing up was a step too far for the adult authorities. Following initial screenings, it was immediately banned in some parts of the country and its release was severely limited. The 20 or so schools where it was shown gave it positive evaluations, including from teachers. These ranged from excellent, most useful, to factual and well presented. But there was a huge media backlash with Cole labeled the sex king and a perverted bastard. Key campaigners for sex education and contraceptive advice for the young blamed Cole for setting their work back by years. The fur furore it created did nothing for the cause of talking openly about sex, especially the joys of sex in YA publishing. What children's publisher could risk being similarly pilloried? Yet quietly things were beginning to change. In Britain, John Rowe Townsend's Good Night Professor Love was published by Oxford University Press in 1970 and was rapidly reprinted several times, including in the Penguin Peacock series, one of the new YA imprints launched in the 1970s. The prof of the title is a geeky teenage schoolboy named Graham Hollis who longs to get away and have romantic es escapades. His waking life is plagued by erotic fantasies that are never quite completed because he's not sure what to do. When his parents go away for a week, he meets Lynn, a young waitress, and it seems as if fantasy and reality are going to merge. Lynn, working class and slightly older than Graham, has considerably more experience of life, including sex, than he does. Graham is seriously smitten with her, but when he introduces her to his parents, things don't go well, and he decides they should elope with his savings. While hitchhiking to Gretna Green to get married, Lynn realizes Graham is in over his head. She secretly arranges for his father to intercept them, but not before they spend a night in a hotel when Lynn introduces him to sex in real life. The event isn't described, but can be deduced from the before and after conversations. So here's before. Oh, sorry. She says, you're trembling, love. That won't do, says Lynn. It's a good job you've got me to look after you. Easy now. Don't think about yourself. Just be natural. This isn't one of your flipping exams. Don't worry, Graham. You haven't a care in the world. Not at this minute, you haven't. Not a care in the world. That constitutes the sex scene. But just in case an inexperienced reader misses the point, after a significant page break, the conversation resumes this way. Don't keep apologizing, pet. There's no call for it. That wasn't very good, Lynn. Of course you weren't. What do you expect? You can't do everything right first time. Their whole affair lasts just nine days. Then Graham's life resumes its adolescent rhythm, though his daydreams are better informed. In 1973, Alan Garner included a sexual, sexual relationship in Redshift, though it is so discreetly embedded in this complex, highly literary novel as to be easily missed. Significantly in terms of adult approval, the sex brings no joy. In fact, the boy Tom is frightened of sex and unsettled by having to listen to the sounds his parents make when they're having sex in the caravan where the three of them live. The young couple's disappointing lovemaking is much less important than the accounts of rapes that happen in the two historical storylines that twine around their own present. The book ends with Tom having a mental collapse, so no joy of sex there. Redshift is an impressive book and an important one 
and, and important as one of the thin ends of the wedge that opened the way for YA fiction that fully acknowledged young people as sexual beings, but it does not address the needs of readers trying to prepare themselves for becoming sexually active. If anything, it shows sex as damaging and best avoided. Then along came 1975 and what I think of as the literary sweet spot or the Goldilocks moment when YA fiction and the publishing industry found the climate just right for introducing genuinely open books featuring sexually active teenagers. The Way was prepared by Judy Bloom's Forever, which has been written about so often, including by me, that I won't go into a detailed close reading here, but it is a keystone text for us, for this theme at least, because it, and so that means it warrants some discussion. It's interesting to compare Bloom's approach with Sex King Martin Coles. Both were revolutionary in their affirmative and frank accounts of preliminary sexual experiences. Though where Cole focused on biology and urges, Bloom provides a well-developed narrative of first sex as part of love. And perhaps I should have said about um, that uh, film called Growing Up. It, it, it is a, a sex education film, but it includes little storylines, little vignettes of the lives of teenagers and with each of which has a kind of uh, trajectory. Bloom's no-nonsense approach to explaining a complete cycle of attraction, preparation, intercourse, and breakup between two responsible and sensibly parented teenagers was immediately valued by young adults. The same qualities have made it one of the most banned books in the world, reminding us that many of the long-standing apparatuses of social management continue to see controlling young people's sexual activity as important. Nowhere is this more evident than in the abstinent cult abstinence culture that has grown up in the US. Casey Ryan Kelly's study of abstinence culture sees it as a response to precisely this kind of positive narrative of sexual liberation. So Bloom can be credited with simultaneously providing the first fully real realized account of sex in YA fiction and a stimulus for the abstinence discourses that were to follow. Forever gestures to the misconceptions promulgated through the kinds of books read before YA fiction began to talk about sex. When Catherine first sees Ralph, which is what um, her boyfriend calls his penis, she's surprised because, this is a quote, in books, penises are always described as hot and throbbing, and Ralph felt like ordinary skin. Instead of romantic cliches about being swept away by desire and satisfaction and fulfillment, Catherine and Michael have to work together to learn how to make intercourse pleasurable for each of them. And there are some comic and unglamorous moments as when Michael explains, quote, I didn't mean to get you as he mops semen off Catherine. Through being open with each other, taking their time, talking to their parents and seeking contraceptive advice, Catherine and Michael have been reassuring readers that sex is a legitimate pleasurable component of adolescent experience for nearly half a century and counting. It's still a popular book. Indeed, it is still a rarity to find happy, well-adjusted girls like Catherine managing love and first sex free from moralizing or life-changing negative consequences. Lisa Dressner makes the same point about films in this period. She says, between the 1970s, rhetoric of sexual liberation and Reagan era just say no abstinence campaigns, teenage films venerated and empowered the decisions girls made about sex. So there was that little Goldilocks moment when girls in particular were empowered to be open to explore and to admit to enjoying sex. In the same spirit, Bloom also makes the experience gender equal. Catherine is as keen to have sex as Michael and enjoys their lovemaking thoroughly once they get it together. Others soon followed in Bloom's footsteps. In the UK, no one initiated more conversations about sex in YA literature than Aidan Chambers, starting with books in the Top Liner series he edited for Macmillan Education. In The Reluctant Reader, Chambers explains that since sex and relationships were at the forefront of teenage concerns, they feature in many of the top liner titles. John Crop Crompton's top liner, Up the Road and Back of 1977, recognizes sexual desire and activity in both girls and boys, 
but like most books from this time, it centers on male experience. As in Goodnight Professor Love, an unnamed teenage boy who is desirous, but too scared and too ignorant to initiate a sexual relationship with his girlfriend, sets off on a hitchhiking road trip with the aim of gaining some sexual experience. When he finally succeeds, nothing happens the way he had imagined it. The woman is married, but bored and angry with her husband on the day they meet. Worse, she changes her mind as soon as he started. So um, the boy, we never know his name, ends up using her and fleeing ashamed and embarrassed. It isn't a rape, right? that, that's clear. She initiated and condones it, but it is desperately uncomfortable all around. While the actual sex in the book ostensibly, ostensibly constitutes the boy's rite of passage, what really changes him are the experiences he has and the people he meets, not the sexual experiences, just the other kinds of encounters that happen to him on his journey. And this, this devalues section is, makes the whole thing about losing your virginity just part of life rather than the main goal of, of it when you're a teenage boy. The book is presented as the boy's retrospective account of his time on the road, and he dwells more on the insights he's gained through conversations than on the sex that was meant to be the point of the trip. After typing it up for him, his sister acknowledges what he's learned. And she says, you'll make a good father and a good husband so long as you see bed isn't what it's all about. This is the lesson readers take away. Sex needs to be part of a loving and responsible relationship. These books show the ideological struggle Casey Ryan Kelly identifies in action. Liberatory and conservative discourses are thoroughly entangled. In the British books, there's also a fairly overt class dimension. Working class youth who have left or will soon leave school feature in less literary books, which also drive home the message about being responsible about pregnancy and consequences. Um, they do that more emphatically than literary ones. Okay, so the Alan Garner book never even talks about the possible consequences of pregnancy and so on. It, it assumes the, the young people are clever and thoughtful enough to sort themselves out in that respect, whereas a working class boy is, um, needs a bit more instruction. Lessons learned through travel, including vicariously while reading, so the you know, mental travel, are also central to another top liner, Ingeborg Bayer and Hans George Noack's David and Dorothea of 1979. This is one of Aidan Chambers' imported and translated titles, and it's a rather claustrophobic West German novel that is paradoxically both sexually confessional and chaste. David, as Dorothea calls him, because he reminds her of a picture of the biblical David in a children's book, is 16 and running away from his grandmother's house where he's been living while his parents negotiate an angry divorce. 18-year-old Dorothea is on her way to live with her parents on an air fort for space in the United States. They meet in Frankfurt Airport and spend a night there while waiting for flights. From the moment they meet, they start opening up about their fears and feelings. After a humiliating experience with a girl in school, David has created a tough, sexy persona by reading material in sex shops, but he confesses that he actually has no experience. Dorothea has the opposite problem. She's pretty and popular, but dislikes herself because she has slept with many boys without caring for any of them. She knows they don't care about her either. Girls with figures like yours are just made for bed, someone told me once, so we went to bed. This was after making sure she had birth control, however. The book offers quite a lot of information about what that involves. It also makes the case that sexual liberation is not liberating at all, stressing again that loveless sex is damaging. Dorothea tells Dan David, I kept on the pill even when I was without a boyfriend for a short time. We swallowed them as easily as you'd eat a cough sweet. We thought we were free. We never noticed we weren't free at all. Ever ready like the scouts, every relationship bound to lead to bed. Sometimes I felt so disgusted with myself, I wanted out. The warning about exploitation is legitimate, but even as YA fiction is starting to talk about sex, one eye is still being kept on officially approved messaging rather than attitudes and experiences in the public at large. More than that, the foundations for what was to become abstinence culture in the US and a culture of fear in the UK, including fear of disease, fear of grooming, fear of misogynistic regimes are apparent. 
such reactionary responses were of course accelerated by the AIDS epidemic, though that was still in the future in 1979. The immediate pressures to avoid encouraging youthful sexual activity were present enough in the form of disapproving correspondence from schools. Editor Aidan Chambers received plenty of angry letters since top liners were sold directly to schools. Like forever, both these top liners have simple plots and are written in a straightforward way to encourage readers to identify with the characters. When Aidan Chambers began to write his own YA novels featuring sex, sexually active teenagers, he took the literary approach we saw being used by Alan Garner. The, what's known as the dance sequence begins with break time in 1978, an intricate metatextual work that garnered praise from critics dis, despite the fact that like the sex education film growing up, it features a teenage boy masturbating and a detailed account of the narrating character's sexual initiation. Since break time, Chambers has written about more kinds of teenage sexual experiences in a more liberal, more European way than most UK or US YA authors. And yet his work has avoided the kinds of criticism he used to have to deal with as the top liner editor, presumably because their literary quality and the demands they make on readers prevent the sex from being remotely sexy. Or perhaps it was assumed that readers capable of enjoying this kind of text were sophisticated enough to be trusted with sexual content. Chambers' novels have attracted a great deal of critical <clears throat> attention, and I've written about them before, so I won't go over that ground again. Although I want to reiterate that they deal intelligently and interestingly with a very wide range of sexual issues, experiences, and desires. Instead, I want to end by returning to the exchange between Robert Westall and Nancy Chambers, with which I began. Westall was prompted to write about sex by a remark of Nancy Chambers's, but evidently his reaction was not what she had expected or intended. She replied to his questions about tone, objectivity, and pornography by saying, the sex business, that was really intended as a rather offhand comment I mentioned it only because you say in your letter, you will have noticed the shifty way I got away from the topic of sex. Nancy Chambers was interested in supporting writers, presumably including her husband, Aidan, who were attempting to break down taboos um, about around talking about sex in YA fiction. She continued, I meant lots of people in the front line need a bit of moral support from those in the public eye and in public print. They need some kind of proof that they are justified in standing up for the books that do include reference to the fact that sex is part of life. I'm not talking about sexual encounters, just the fact that sexual interest exists is enough to send some people into a passion of threats and righteousness. The objects of their anger are usually teachers. And it's probably relevant to, to say here that Aidan Chambers had been a teacher and would have experienced um, the, that kind of anger as well. She then goes on, what I certainly didn't mean to say was that I felt you should be writing about sex. You can get in enough trouble saying fart without dealing with the other four letter F. Although she puts no pressure on him, this exchange may have helped Westall, a former art teacher, feel he had a duty to himself and other children's writers to include sexual relationships in his work. They certainly crop up consistently thereafter, though usually when they, when they involve teenagers alone, the relationships are more romantic than erotic and set apart from present day reality through the use of past events or supernatural elements. Falling into glory of 1993, <clears throat> excuse me, contains one of the most fully developed sexual relationships in his output. But since it's semi-autobiographical, it's safely distanced in time. Just excuse me for a moment. In it, the protagonist, Robbie, is a bit of what we call a Mary Sue character. So a kind of ego ideal for the author. He's a attractive, athletic, academic, and the love interest of Emma, the attractive young widow who teaches classics. He also, of course, turns out to be good at sex. Like all of us in the days before YA literature talked about sex, Robbie has been reading about it where he can. 
what are described as torrid love scenes and sloppy corniness in his mother's books, gymnastic exploits in his father's dirty books, and things like that. <coughs> These he pronounces, once he has some experience, have it all wrong. He's now the expert. There follows an ornate passage about women's bodies and how he feels like a great magician able to raise storms and tempests at will. Even this book, which allows Robbie a great deal of sex of one kind or another, keeps an eye on the adult gatekeepers. As well as its use of the past, there is also a vivid warning in the form of Robbie's friend, Benny, who has had to marry his pregnant girlfriend and support her. Robbie is clear that he'd rather be a monk for life than end up like Benny. In 1993, fear of pregnancy was no longer the deterrent it once was, yet the story continues to emphasize the potential, potential consequences of their relationship for both Robbie and Emma, rather than the pleasure. As these examples show, between the 1960s and the 1990s, the taboo that forbade talking about sex was finally broken, though the conversations varied on the basis of class and they privileged white male heterosexual experience. Usually they also focused on problems and consequences rather than shared pleasure and relationships. The emphasis on problems intensified when a new consequence arrived in the form of AIDS. This, Britain's continuing high rate of teenage pregnancy and increase, increased rates of sexually transmitted diseases reignited earlier ideological struggles around the need to control young people's sexual activity. In the early 2000s, Melvin Burgess was attacked in ways reminiscent of growing up for his frank portrayals of adolescent sex. And you can see um, the then uh, children's laureate and filth described his book doing it as filth whichever way you look at it. Nevertheless, in a 2005 interview to celebrate 30 years of forever, Judy Bloom was cautiously optimistic, first identifying the 1970s as a much more open decade, then pointing to the censorship occasioned by the current fanatically religious political climate but finally saying that publishers were finding ways to publish some very good books that deal frankly with sex, in my experience, conversations about sex and YA literature today focus more on the negative abuse and grooming than they do on cultivating positive attitudes as part of learning about the kind of sexual or indeed asexual being one is. Behind the scenes, entrenched discourses and policies still equate sexual liberation of any kind with challenges to authority. As a consequence, while YA fiction is talking about sex, we need to ask ourselves as students of children's literature, how far these conversations respond to the needs and experiences of 21st century youth and how far the, the debates are mired in old attitudes and ideologies. Thank you very much for, for listening. And I hope some of that was relevant to your own uh, experience and discussions in the course of this day. Thank you, ma'am, for gracing the occasion with your presence and an interesting academic session on a less talked about perspective in children's literature and young adults literature. Thank you, ma'am. My pleasure. Gratitude is not only the greatest virtue, but the parent of all the thoughts. Dr. V. Matanki, Assistant Professor and Organizing Secretary, Department of English, PSG Krishnamal College for Women, to propose the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, one and all. It is with a deep sense of gratitude that I stand before you, or rather sit before you, to propose the vote of thanks. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor Kimberly Reynolds, Professor of Children's Literature, School of English Literature, Language and Linguistics, Newcastle University, for having readily accepted our invite and for delivering a revelatory validatory address that has struck the appropriate concluding note for the seminar. Her lecture provided the context for what is a very prominent recent trend in UK and USA in young adults' novels with considerable sexual content, 
it is so surprising to know that a taboo topic like sex has been handled explicitly as early as the 70s and 80s in young adult fiction ma'am the examples that you have given are really stunners something i never thought will find a place in young adult novels thank you for the eye opening perspective i would like to place my respects to the founders shri govinda rajulu and shri mati chandra gandhi govinda rajulu many thanks to the managing trustee shri ji rangaswami and the chairperson dr r nandini for their support our secretary dr n yashoda devi principal dr s nirmala and our dean alumni relations and student support dr r padmavati have been the wind behind our wings motivating us in all our endeavors i place on record my thanks to the speakers of the four known session dr s chitra from yon pula centenary college royal university of bhutan and dr anto thomas chakramahil from st thomas college thrissur i thank all the staff who have chaired the parallel paper presentation sessions dr nagarajan mandali dr sumati ramu dr bhuvana dr sanjeev kumar sharma dr pallavija dr pankaj gogai dr nila and dr shishma mishra for their presence and contribution i thank the head of the department dr shushil mary matthews for her help and support she is a leader who shows the way leads the way and goes the way i also record my thanks to my colleagues mrs maheshwari mrs subapriya dr sumati k swami dr angelin dr danalakshmi ms anuradha dr lavanya dr santosh priya dr jayashree mrs ramya ms karen vinita ms napula dr purnamathi meenakshi and ms aisha i thank all of them for their good will and sustained assistance in conducting the entire event a special mention to dr sumati ramu associate professor retired department of english krishnamal college ma'am will be my constant source of inspiration wherever she is i also thank my dear colleague friends ms vanmati and dr s gomati for their love and companionship bear with me a little longer i thank the entire de department and the battalion of students and scholars who have helped me over the past few days i thank ms rebecca l sajes the department secretary and ms padma vikashini the joint secretary for their ceaseless hard work i also thank the scholars jayasiba ponmani kirtana krishnapriya kavya janusha prasnan snigda praise vinita raj soundarya and venba for the meticulous work that they have done for the past couple of days a special word of mention to ms kavya k research scholar who conducted the virtual session single handedly and flawlessly i owe so much to her i thank mrs danam who took care of the department housekeeping my thanks to mr arun for technical assistance the online sessions come with their own set of challenges and without the help of this entire team of colleagues and students i would not have been able to pull it off a huge thanks to all the participants and paper presenters whose academic endeavors fuel our efforts and make them meaningful last but not the least i thank all the ug and pg students for their patient listening i close on a note of hope that this session and all of today's sessions had been the most productive and purposeful thank you so much once again thank you professor enos it has been an honor my pleasure and thank you for including me in your program thank you so much ma'am okay shall i leave now yeah, yes ma'am yes ma'am until we meet later okay for some other program thank you You are a wonderful audience, and your presence made this day memorable. And we believe that we too have been a good host. We hope this was an informative and beneficial forum with many ideas and perspectives that would make an intellectual impact on you. We hope to meet you all soon in yet another interesting academic exercise. This is Jasuba and Sundarya signing off on behalf of everyone. Take care, stay safe, and goodbye.
Thank you, Jaisiba and Soundarya. A kind reminder, dear participants, the link to post your feedback for the valedictory session has been shared, shared in the chat box. Kindly copy the link and then leave the session. Thank you. The same will also be shared with the WhatsApp group for all the presenters and participants. And we also note that to do the submission of your Kindly also note 